Welcome to the CAA 2021 webinar series. Today's webinar is update of AHA and ERC CPR guidelines, proudly supported by Philips and presented by Dr. Benjamin Abella. Thanks for joining us and please enjoy. Hi, my name is David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Benjamin Abella. He's going to join us to discuss the main revisions in the American Heart Association and European Resuscitation Council guidelines. This webinar is proudly supported by Philips, one of our inaugural CAA Business Directory Diamond Level members. In this session, Dr. Abella will be exploring the scientific evidence that led to these changes and updates. In addition, Dr. Abella will also be looking at other key interest areas in CPR and resuscitation science and share the learnings and experience, especially following the COVID-19 pandemic. A little bit more about our speaker today. Dr. Benjamin Abella is a professor and vice chair of research for the Center of Resuscitation Science and Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Abella studies sudden cardiac arrest, the leading cause of death that claims over 350,000 lives each year in the United States, which is very comparable to the 35,000 lives lost here in Australia and New Zealand each year. He is also the developer and medical director of a novel training course for post-arrest care and targeted temperature management, TTM, called the Penn TTM Academy. Dr. Abella has published over 200 articles and reviews in numerous professional journals including the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA and Circulation, as well as textbooks, chapters on cardiac arrest and resuscitation. He is the co-chair of the Global Resuscitation Science Symposium and has participated in developing international CPR guidelines. He has won a number of honours for his research and his teaching of residents and medical students and has lectured widely on the topics of cardiac arrest and post-arrest treatment. We will follow this presentation with a live Q&A session with Dr. Bella, so stay online for that. Now again, thanks to Philips for making this webinar possible, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Abella. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very glad to be with you today to talk about uh, cardiac arrest and CPR. A little bit about myself briefly. I'm a uh, professor of emergency medicine at the University of Pennsylvania where I lead an entity called the Center for Resuscitation Science, which is a research center devoted to cardiac arrest, CPR, and post-arrest care. The goal of today's lecture is to share with you a number of topics. It's going to be sort of a broad range. We'll be talking about the new international guidelines for cardiac arrest and CPR, focusing specifically on resuscitation care. We won't talk about post-arrest care today. I'll then share with you some of the science, some of the context that led to those guidelines so we can understand a little bit better the data supporting some concepts of CPR quality and the performance of resuscitation care. Then we'll cover some newer uh, uh, directions for resuscitation care, including things like mechanical CPR, Reboa, and some other uh, techniques in defibrillation and other uh, resuscitation maneuvers. And then finally, we will cover a little bit on what it means to resuscitate people in this era of COVID-19 and some of the implications for CPR in the pandemic. So it's a bit of an ambitious agenda, but let's give it a go. Uh, first, a little bit about uh, uh, my disclosures to let you know I do receive research funding from a number of sources. I've also, um, I'm on the advisory board of two small companies, MD Ally and VOC Health. Neither of them have anything to do with CPR delivery. And I also uh, should tell you that today I was uh, funded to give this lecture uh, by Philips, um, but I do not have any stock or, or other sort of relationship with Philips beyond uh, the lecture today. Now, to get us started, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with some basic facts, and I'll go through this fairly quickly over the next few minutes. So cardiac arrest, as you all know, is when the heart stops beating. And so you go from a normal rhythm like this to a chaotic rhythm like this. This is ventricular fibrillation. There's no cardiac output. There's no blood flow. And so in this sense, cardiac arrest represents the abrupt and total loss of cardiac output throughout the body, and it's uniformly fatal 
unless immediate treatment is given. So that's sort of the overall context for our discussion uh, today. Now, in the United States, it's estimated that over 350,000 people experience cardiac arrest every year. So this is a really widespread problem. And, and in most uh, countries, cardiac arrest is a major cause of death. The typical ages of people who suffer cardiac arrest are in their 50s and 60s, but it does vary considerably. And men and women are both affected. So this is a broad disease that affects all walks of life, all levels of income and education, uh, races and genders. So it's, it's, a, it's a major, major challenge. When we ask the question of when do people actually die from cardiac arrest, uh, I show you the schematic to show you that um, despite CPR and defibrillation, that is despite the initial actions in cardiac arrest resuscitation, many people succumb to arrest. So we, so we don't get everyone back. Well, we do get some people back and that's called return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. And then a major injury has occurred such that many people, even after they get their pulse back, succumb to post-arrest injury. So there's two areas, two drop-offs when people die from cardiac arrest. In this lecture today, we're really just gonna focus on this first drop-off because that's where we can make the most impact and for pre-hospital providers, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, this is uh, the most important domain for excellence, the most important domain where we can make an impact. So let's turn to the new guidelines. Now, uh, for a little quick refresher for those who may not know or remember, every five years, the international community comes up with new resuscitation guidelines based on uh, consensus of science over the pre prior five years. And then in each country, these are interpreted, or in the case of Europe, the European Resuscitation Council, a European-wide coalition, each country uh, interprets this consensus on science to derive actual guidelines, actual uh, uh, pragmatic implementation tools. Well, the American Heart Association, or AHA in the United States, comes up with these guidelines. And in the 2020 guidelines, one of the key components that gets reaffirmed, it's not new for this year, but, but is reaffirmed, is the concept of the quality of CPR and, and the need to perform high quality CPR. And what do we mean by that? Well, CPR should be performed at a rate of around 100 to 120 beats per minute or compressions per minute at a depth of over two inches. And the guidelines suggest that audiovisual field feedback, real-time feedback, uh, can be useful as a tool to maintain CPR quality. And we'll be getting into the data supporting all of this uh, shortly, but again, this is just the overview. Now, this is not new, but it stood the test of time and it's been reinforced in the guidelines. Now, a couple other key points about resuscitation care, and we're not gonna talk about epinephrine or access today, but just to mention it, the data continues to support the notion that epinephrine is a drug that should be given early. Uh, uh, there's some controversy about epinephrine, but what is increasingly clear is that timing is important. Also, it's important to get IV access. Um, there was a lot of interest in IO for a number of years, and, and there still is interest, but newer data seems to suggest that the emphasis should be on intravenous and IO only as a rescue. But again, we're not gonna focus on those today, but rather all the actions of CPR quality and CPR feedback. We will also talk a little bit about defibrillation. And in the guidelines, they reinforce again the importance of defibrillation for VFib and pulseless VTAC. They spend a little time on this concept of double sequential defibrillation, DSD. And, and DSD has become a bit of a hot topic uh, of late, and we'll talk a little bit about the data that may suggest its value. But in short, um, DSD is not yet clearly established. The, the science around it is evolving, and so the routine use of DSD is not recommended in the guidelines. But we, we will talk about this more. Now, another newer technique that is introduced in the new guidelines uh, regarding CPR and resuscitation care, and we will share some data on this, is the use of point-of-care ultrasound. This is an exciting modality that's been around for some time, but in, in current thinking, the role of TEE, especially transesophageal echocardiography, is an exciting early uh, we're in an exciting early stage for this uh, therapy, um, or I should say this diagnostic modality, TTE, transthoracic echocardiography, has been around for quite some time in cardiac arrest, but there's been some controversy about it because as you probably realize, if you're doing TTE, you're sort of in the way of the compressor and, and there's often increased pause time. 
the notion is that you might be able to do point of care ultrasound with an esophageal probe, and it may very well uh, uh, change the game because it no longer forces interruptions and compressions. But we will we will talk about this a little bit later, and we won't talk about neuroprognostication or post arrest care. I just show you the slide to show you the new major things in the guidelines this year. Now, what do they say specifically about what will be really the core of this lecture, which is um, audiovisual feedback and CPR quality? Well, if you think about it, feedback comes in two forms. There's feedback on performance, and then there's feedback on physiology. The, the feedback on performance is very well established. It's incorporated into a number of defibrillators from a number of different companies, and there's a growing body of data around this, and I'll share with you some of it. But there's RCT level data that support the notion of, of feedback uh, may improve uh, outcomes. So feedback on performance. Now, physiologic monitoring is much less clear, but is enticing. It's, it's of interest because if you think about it, um, perhaps we shouldn't consider it a uh, perfect CPR to perform at a given rate and depth. What we should consider perfect CPR is giving the patient what they need and looking at physiologic response. The problem is we're just not sure what response is the best to measure in the year 2021. So for example, studies have looked at end tidal CO2 as a marker, and we will discuss some of the data on that, um, as well as uh, looking at mean arterial pressure uh, during uh, CPR performance. And so those are ongoing notions. The data are less clear, uh, but the guidelines do suggest that one might be able to use these and tidal CO2 and other methods to look at physiology during cardiac rest. But again, it has to be used um, with some caveats and, and I'll share with you when we, when we get into the data on that. Now, one really important thing that the guidelines emphasize, and I would emphasize as well, is that education and training are key, especially when you're thinking about audiovisual feedback. And when we get into the data, you'll see that the devices themselves are useful but the training and education around the devices are crucial. And this goes for resuscitation care in general. And, and the um, AHA sort of suggests a number of ways or number of domains for education training, teamwork, uh, the use of in situ training or simulation training. And, and then there's a lot of explorations of late in gamified learning and virtual reality. So there's a lot of ways to approach this, but fundamentally, and, and I think this is great, the guidelines emphasize the fact that this isn't something that's plug and play. We need to learn, we need to relearn, we need to debrief, and, and we'll get into some of this. But first, I think it's important, now that we've sort of encapsulated what the new guidelines show, um, where did this all come from? And, and what are the data supporting the importance of CPR quality, audiovisual feedback, and such uh, interventions? Well, the, the notion of CPR quality being important has been around for a while, um, and, and, and I could share with you many studies to suggest that CPR quality is important, but I'm just going to pick a few, a little sampler platter, if you will, of studies that suggest that the way we do CPR matters quite a bit. And, and this is one study I, I'd like to highlight because it's a very dramatic demonstration of a slight tweaking of CPR. This was a multi-center study uh, in 2010 uh, that looked at dispatch-assisted CPR. So when bystanders would call in the United States 911, when they'd call the emergency response number, um, the dispatchers would give a script for CPR performance. And in this case, they randomized people to two forms of the script. One form was with what at the time was standard CPR, 30 compressions, two breaths. And the other was compressions alone with no breaths. Now, at the time, this was controversial, even crazy, because we all felt that breathing was important during cardiac arrest, um, or I should say the delivery of breaths was important. But in fact, survival was statistically much higher in the group with compressions only. And this was a little surprising. It's one of the reasons it made it to New England Journal. But the notion is that by tweaking the CPR instructions to minimize pauses in this case, minimize pauses and compression, you could greatly improve survival. Now, how could this be? How could a little tweak to, to remove the pauses during which the rescuers were breathing for a patient make such a difference? Well, I show you here an animal study uh, that probably gives a key clue to this. This is from Bob Berg and colleagues. This was done earlier. And indeed, this was one of the studies that suggested the notion of hands-only CPR. This is an animal, and, and this isn't exactly to scale. I've sort of uh, uh, cartoonified it, but these are real data from their paper showing that every time you compress, it takes a little while to ramp up the pressure. Whenever you stop compression, the pressure falls and you, and you redo the cycle. So every pause, no matter how short, may be deleterious. 
here you have an animal that has continuous compressions with no pauses. And I'm, I sort of show you a ghost of the two so you can sort of see the difference there. If you do continuous compressions, you reach a steady state. And in this case, they were measuring aortic blood pressure, but presumably also a steady state coronary perfusion pressure, uh, which makes the heart more um, amenable to defibrillation and other um, actions. So, so the notion here is that by, by increasing compressions, changing the way we do CPR, focusing on minimizing pauses, we might improve outcomes. Here's the hemodynamic data. The, the trial I showed you before is the clinical outcomes data for that. Well, it's not just about rate. Uh, depth is, of course, important as well. And, and by rate, I mean content of, of compressions, you know, the, the number of compressions someone delivers. Depth is important as well. And this is a large study here from the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, or ROC. This was a large multi-center group in the United States that showed that the deeper one compresses during an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the more likelihood you have of survival. And so these are some of the clearest data um, on compression depth and that it really matters. Uh, and so uh, it seems to plateau over two inches, thus the current resuscitation guidelines, uh, two inches, I should say 50 millimeters. Um, it's about the same. Um, and, and so this speaks to the notion that we have to emphasize deep compressions. We have to emphasize few pauses. So how are we going to do that? Well, it's a real challenge um, for those of you who practice resuscitation on a daily basis. We don't get out a ruler and, and look at depth, um, and, and nor do we have an, always a metronome to measure rate, or at least we didn't until these devices came along uh, to support us in, in giving high quality CPR. Now, one of the questions that came about as the data evolved about rate and depth was whether there was a sweet spot. A sweet spot for rate or depth. In other words, was there a too fast or too slow? Was there a too deep or too shallow? And we did a meta-analysis of uh, some primary data from a number of studies that looked at rate and found that indeed there was a too slow and a too fast. So there was a sweet spot. In, in our work, um, the, the sweet spot appeared to be around 90 to 95 compressions per minute yielded the best survival benefit. Now, I should tell you another meta-analysis found a 100 to 110 to be that optimal uh, compression rate. So it remains a little unclear what the optimal rate should be. However, what is clear is too fast is bad, too slow is bad. You, it's a Goldilocks kind of solution. You want it just right, right in the middle. Now, when we looked at um, depth in our meta-analysis, uh, and, and this is a busy slide, I'm just gonna summarize the main point, is that we did not find that there was a too deep. Uh, when we looked at a number of these studies and we looked at the primary data, um, it turns out too deep may be a fantasy. In, in the real world, uh, it's really hard to sustain deep compressions for a long period of time. Thus, the guidelines uh, uh, order to push hard and push fast. Uh, the general instruction we give to the public is just to push hard because indeed um, uh, too hard is, is hard to do and we'd rather err on the side of pushing harder and moving blood. Well, if these things are important, and I, I've breezed through a very small sampler platter, as I suggested, of, of the studies supporting CPR quality, you'll have to trust me when I say there are many more where that came from. And I will show you a few more later when we talk about feedback. It, it therefore is incumbent upon us to measure our quality and, and to find a way to measure and then impact it. And so I show you here a number of defibrillators. I, I show you the ones that we use actually in our hospital. We use the Philips MRX, which is, uh, uh, looks a little bit like these. These are some newer models from Philips. Um, but they have this sensor. You see, it, some people call it a puck there on the one on the left. And, and this puck sits on the middle of the chest and allows you to measure compression rate and depth through force detection and accelerometer technology. And so you can actually measure CPR quality. And this was uh, largely rolled out sort of about 10 to 15 years ago, um, but, it's, but it's made a big impact in the systems that use these uh, modalities. And um, we did some early research with a prototype of this device when we uh, were interested in studying CPR quality. And I show you here some work from our team where we asked a simple question, during in-hospital cardiac arrest, how are people doing? What is the quality of CPR delivery from ACLS trained providers in the hospital? And what we found was, and this is a frequency histogram, that compression rates were all over the map in the real world, in actual practice. And so you see the dotted line there, that's at 100 compressions per minute. You see that in real life, sometimes it was too slow, sometimes it was too fast. This was before the concept of using a metronome or any kind of guidance. We just passively measured 
CPR quality using this prototype. And it was alarming because these people were all trained. If you asked any of these rescuers, they'd say, oh yeah, we're supposed to compress at 100 per minute, but they weren't doing it. So then we asked, did it matter? And when you looked at whether people got their pulse back or not, indeed it mattered. The group that got their pulse back had a higher compression rate than those that didn't. Again, reinforcing the notion that CPR quality probably does indeed matter. Now, when you actually measure CPR, um, you get these nice transcripts from these defibrillators. You can learn a lot of other things that relate to quality of performance. So for example, here I show you a pre-shock pause. There's compressions being delivered. That's the green little, uh, little sawtooth thing there on the left. Then there's a pause and then there's a shock and you see those bars representing events in the top strip. And you see here a very clear example of nice juicy ventricular fibrillation. It took them, however, 15 seconds between the last compression and a shock. And one might wonder, why did it take so long? One might also say, well, 15 seconds isn't so bad, right? Well, that's a testable hypothesis. And so one of the aspects of CPR quality is pre-shock pauses. And, and the reason why it is, is because data like I'm about to show you from our team, and there's other data from other centers, where the shock effectiveness falls very rapidly with increasing duration of pre-shock pause. We did a quartile analysis. That's why the time intervals are a little bit funny. But suffice it to say, if a shock um, was delivered less than 10 seconds from a compressions, uh, uh, you, you got a lot of bang for the buck. You had a good chance of, of removing V-fib and getting ROSC. However, if you took 15, 20, 30 seconds, you lost a lot of your effectiveness. Now, this is really important if you think about AEDs, which have mandatory hands-off time to do analysis. It used to be, in the old days, that the mandatory analysis time for just for the computer and the AED to work required a pause of 15, 20 seconds. Well, that's a real problem. Thankfully, the newer AEDs have a much better um, um, modality and um, um, it, it can be eight to nine seconds, much shorter. So this is a, an important notion of CPR quality, uh, this pre-shock pause time and how we measure it. Now, if you want a nice summary of uh, the variety of aspects of CPR quality, this is, I think, one of the best summaries of CPR quality and the data supporting it. So if I was going to give you one homework assignment of a reading, it would be this. This is a statement from the American Heart Association that looked at CPR quality um, and what it means. And it summarizes a lot of these studies that we've gone through and, and highlights sort of the key aspects. If you want to do good CPR, what it means and what are the data supporting those approaches. Well, one of the things that is suggested in, in this document is this notion of debriefing. And this is sort of a, a concept piece because we don't routinely do this. We should perhaps, but in most centers, this isn't routine part of practice. But the idea is imagine a world where every resuscitation effort had some form of recording of quality, either on the left here, a subjective recording, or on the right, a quantitative recording. And so you could imagine someone showing up with a report card where you check if, you know, was the team leader identified? Yes, no, eh, so-so. Was the scene orderly? Was the defibrillator quite quickly? And wouldn't this be a wonderful QA tool to track and then give feedback immediately after a code? Now, on the right, you might see a quantitative one that might come off a defibrillator. And this is now what these defibrillators can do, where you get your compression rate and depth and all this sort of information. So it can be, uh, it can be very uh, helpful in that regard. So when this was proposed in 2013, the idea was that w we wanted to encourage the resuscitation world to think about ways to debrief and develop tools and test tools that worked in their settings. Now, does it matter? Do they work? Well, this is work that we did where we combined audiovisual feedback with a debriefing modality. And so this was called the, the RAPID study, um, where we basically used the AV feedback in a Phillips defibrillator, but then also used it to have quantitative feedback to teams afterwards, debriefing, where we talked about the quality of CPR and sort of showed them their own transcripts. And we found that when we implemented audiovisual feedback with this educational tool, we increased compliance for ventilation, compression rate, depth, and most importantly, we improved survival. We got more people to achieve ROSC. So this sort of highlights several things, that audiovisual feedback is powerful when it's combined with education, with debriefing, and that you can actually improve meaningful patient survival with these tools. Now, this is from in-hospital arrest. What about out-of-hospital arrest? Well, this is a study uh, by a friend of mine, Ben Bobro, um, who was in Arizona at the time, 
where they did similar sort of work, um, but they did this in the out of hospital setting where they did a specific training, then they had audio visual feedback, and then they debriefed based on the quantitative feedback. And what they found was they could actually improve not just survival, but actually neurologic recovery. So it's, it's a very impressive study, actually. So this was another study showing that when audiovisual feedback was used with a strong educational component, you could really make a difference and improve quality in your system. Now, lest I give you a overly rosy picture, I think a cautionary tale is also necessary. This was a large study performed by the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, randomized trial, looking at the role of feedback. It was a very modest result. They found no difference in survival. There were some minor changes in CPR quality, but you can sort of see from these graphs, just as a quick visual, that the CPR quality didn't budge that much. Now, what was the difference? In this study, it was sort of a pragmatic study. They did not couple it with a strong education or debriefing thing. They just had CPR feedback. They briefly showed the medics what it did and how it worked, and that was it. So to me, this says that audiovisual feedback works at its best when it's coupled with education, coupled with debriefing. And I think this is a classic theme in medicine. We, we like to come up with new technologies and just plug it in and assume it's going to solve our problems. But if there's humans on the other end of that technology, they need training, they need familiarity, and they need some quality correction. Well, this notion of CPR quality is now spread more broadly to even perhaps the public. And, and there's some a number of studies now that have looked at using the accelerometers that are ubiquitous and smartphones and smartwatches and all sorts of things that we own. And, and could they be used to measure compression rate and depth and improve so? And, and this is one such example of this where a watch was used to look at um, compression rate for bystanders. Because after all, a bystander won't have a monitored defibrillator right with them, but they might have a smartphone or a watch. And certainly some of this technology is incorporated into AEDs, but many bystanders aren't have ready, unfortunately don't have ready availability of those devices either. Now, what about this concept of physiologic uh, feedback? Well, one of the topics of interest is the use of end tidal CO2. And those of you who are familiar with this know that end tidal CO2 is non-invasive. We have it on most of our defibrillators and most of our ambulances. And what it essentially measures is exhaled carbon dioxide, which in cardiac rest and low flow states correlates reasonably well with blood flow. So the more blood flow with CPR, the higher the end tidal CO2, the less blood flow, the lower. So you could imagine conceptually that it could be a CPR monitor that better CPR, however defined, would cause higher end tidal CO2, which meant better blood flow. Well, this is very exciting in theory. Um, we looked at this in practice, and while we did find that indeed, both rate and depth correlated with end tidal CO2, and I show you one graph here, that the deeper you push, the higher the end tidal CO2. But, but before I suggest this is a, a great study, look at the, um, the scale on the y-axis very, very minimal differences. Um, this is because it averages from a lot of cardiac arrest events and there's a lot of noise in the signal. So it's not that dramatic. The slope of this relationship is very modest. So what we concluded was yes, untitled CO2 correlates with CPR quality, but gosh, it's really hard to use in the real world. A lot of things confound the results. A lot of things impact the um, findings that you might have. So, so there's interest and there's continued interest in untitled CO2, but, but I think we're going to need to invoke things like machine learning and better algorithms to filter out noise or to at least understand in given patients um, what untitled CO2 may mean. Because after all, physiology impacts untitled CO2 their original uh, uh, state before arrest may impact it. So uh, lung function may impact it. So what about blood pressure? That's another thing that's been uh, studied in the last uh, few years, five, 10 years. Um, and, and so this is some work from uh, our larger team at Penn looking at using mean arterial pressure um, and, and actually diastolic pressure both, and, and uh, but basically looking using blood pressure during cardiac arrest. Now, how do you have that? Well, this was uh, cardiac arrest in the hospital, um, looking at in-hospital codes in the ICU where they had an arterial line in place. Pretty convenient, not so applicable out of hospital cardiac arrest, at least not 
easily applicable. Nonetheless, it was a good way to look at this. So, so these were um, patients who had cardiac arrest in the pediatric ICU. They had a um, arterial line in. And what they found was that when they guided care based on guidelines, it was less effective than guiding care based on blood pressure. So again, using physiology, physiology could be an effective way to do this. We also did this in the, in the pig lab and found that it was effective as well. Now, um, what I show you here is a comparison of these two approaches. So uh, uh, this is looking at using antidote CO2 versus a diastolic blood pressure approach. And in their hands anyway, they found that using diastolic blood pressure was a better approach. So, um, but again, the practicalities of having an arterial line and looking at this are, are hard, but again, proof of concept. And I do think that the future of resuscitation care will invoke more tools. And I encourage industries, uh, industrial partners like Philips to think about these things, to, to work to develop better smart sensors that give us feedback, not just on performance, but on physiology. Now, in a way, it's not exactly physiology, but it's a little bit of physiology. Could you use TEE to look at heart function during CPR? And indeed, this is some work from one of my fellows, Felipe Turan, um, who has really been one of the pioneers in this topic. But TEE during cardiac arrest and critical care has been a very hot topic of late, with good reason. With the notion being that you can slip in this probe, you get very good images during CPR. You don't have to stop compressions um, and you get a lot of information. For example, you may get information about a blood clot um, um, in the heart or, or a pulmonary embolism um, based on uh, the, the geometry of the right ventricle and so forth. So you can get a lot of information. One of the things we found was often the point of compression needed to be adjusted because in, depending on a person's anatomy, in many uh, situations, people were compressing directly over the aortic outflow tract and actually impeding blood flow. So, so TE was a very interesting uh, approach. And here you see um, how uh, we had a number of different findings in a case series of cardiac arrest where we used TEE. In some cases, we found intracardiac thrombus. In some cases, it was very clear uh, that there was an obstructive shock picture or that there was compression of the LVOT, left ventricular uh, outflow tract. So, so uh, there was a lot of physiology to be measured with use of TEE. Now, it's not been subjected to randomized trial. Uh, it also has not been tried, to my knowledge anyway, in the pre-hospital setting. I think that will be coming though. I think through the use of medical command and telemedicine, TEE in the pre-hospital setting may be uh, what's next in the next five to 10 years. And I look forward to uh, pioneers pushing this technology further. Now, on a less exciting note, but but um, but also uh, an impact of technology in cardiac arrest is to use mechanical CPR. And many of you may be familiar with these devices, the Autopulse by Zoll and the Lucas device, which is uh, originally made from by Joe Life, but, but sold in the U.S. by Stryker. These are um, technologies to do mechanical CPR. However, however, lest you think they're the best thing um, ever, there have been no randomized trials to show they're better than manual CPR. Several studies have shown they're equal. The data on mechanical CPR are very complicated and very mixed. Um, so, so the shortest answer I can give you, in the year 2020, they basically didn't change. The guidelines can't recommend that we switch to mechanical CPR devices. There are certainly some situations where they probably have a lot of value, like long transports. But, but as I said, the data are complicated. I think, again, because there's a human element. People have to be trained with how to use them, how to hook them up, and so forth. We studied this in the United States. And really found that manual CPR had a higher survival in a very large cohort than mechanical CPR. Now, these were non-randomized data, so there are some real uh, fine print to be thought through, but oops, but fundamentally, uh, we did not find that mechanical CPR was better. Uh, some studies have suggested it is equal, randomized controlled trials that you may be familiar with. Well, what about other technologies to enhance CPR. Some of you may have heard of Reboa. I also think Reboa is going to be one of the big hot topics for the next five years in resuscitation and, and CPR. Reboa is a, a occlusion of the distal aorta to improve 
blood flow to the heart and the brain. Um, it's been whoops. It's been used in trauma um, uh, with some uh, su some success in some settings. Lower uh, you know vascular trauma to the abdomen, for example. But its role in cardiac arrest is yet to be established. But people are certainly looking at it. And so here's an animal model where they did Reboa. This was done um, by colleagues at University of Michigan, where they had successive inflations and deflations of an aortic balloon during cardiac arrest. And what they found was they got much better pressures and hemodynamics when the balloon was inflated. And they got better ROSC in the SWAN model as well. Now, hasn't been subjected to rigorous analysis in humans yet, and I think that will come. And I know some groups are actually planning and designing studies of Reboa during cardiac arrest. It's an exciting idea, um, but again, technically difficult. It's got to be placed. It's got to be um, um, put in the order, which is a non-trivial intervention. So this may not be a field intervention. This may be a hospital-based or ED-based intervention. Um, and, and so, uh, also, of course, it will require training. And um, so, so there's some studies looking at different modalities to perform Reboa education for clinicians. So, as I say, it's a growing, interesting area that a number of groups are pursuing. And I encourage you to keep an eye. I think Reboa and TEE are going to be two big areas for the next five years of resuscitation care. For some reason, my slides are auto advancing. So if you see me going back a slide, this has happened to me before. It's a weird artifact of Zoom. I'm not sure what's going on, but we'll work with it. One of the other questions that comes up in um, resuscitation care is what's the right energy? And then this notion that I introduced briefly earlier called DSD, double sequential defibrillation. Um, Many defibrillators uh, have been made to go to different energies. So, for example, some defibrillators go to 200 joules, some go to 360. And there's been this sort of raging debate of what the right energy for uh, shocking a patient out of VFib or VTAC might be. We don't really know. However, I show you here just one study that showed um, basically over time uh, the, the adoption of a, not a different energy, but biphasic defibrillation. But then they also looked at the energies. And they found that in clinical practice, most people people use 200 joules or 150, that doesn't mean it's best. That's just what most people used in clinical practice. But then um, other studies have looked at the first shock energy um, and, and, and V-fib termination. There's some suggestion that 150 may be adequate um, and may be better than 200 joules, that maybe high energies cause injury. On the other hand, to be fair, there's some studies that suggest 360 is better. So fundamentally, we don't really know what the best energy is. I would say this, it all works. Um, and, and, and there's very good evidence that 200 joules works, that 360 joules works, that 150 works. The specific energy, it may just be hard to generalize, and it may depend on the patient, the size of the patient, what their exact rhythm is. So in the year 2021, we can't say that 360 is better than 200, is better than 150, or vice versa. And here's another study that looked at 360 versus 200 and different strategies, and they really didn't find any difference in first shock efficacy. Again, showing that there's just not that much difference um, at, when, when people have looked at this. Now, this concept of DSD is a very interesting one. This, briefly, the notion is this. Maybe it's not just a question of more energy, but hitting the heart from multiple vectors with more energy. Uh, said more simply and practically, the idea is could you put on four pads instead of two, two pads from two different defibrillators, and could you hit the buttons at the same time and improve VFib? conversion. And this would be especially good for refractory VFib. It's an interesting concept. And a number of studies have looked at this over time. And so, for example, this is just a, a, a sort of a case series experience um, from England, where they found that maybe DSD uh, might have some slight advantage. They, they, statistically, they found no difference. Um, but they found that DSD was often useful as a rescue, where they used um, regular defibrillation, and then they'd say, oh, it didn't work, we'll do DSD. And, and they were able to rescue some patients. It's not proof it works generally, but it's an interesting um, notion. Well, here's another study um, out of uh, Canada. Sheldon Cheskis has been a real leader in the DSD world. He's out of Ontario. Um, and, and there's actually a large randomized trial underway right now, led by him, on DSD. And we, we're expecting results in, in coming months to year um, to see whether for refractory VFib, whether DSD is helpful. Now, another important concept, um, I think, now and for the future during resuscitation care is the role of eCPR, which is basically ECMO during cardiac arrest. And I show you here a complex 
heart-lung bypass machine, just to show you what ECMO is. Um, and this is this is really not ECMO per se. This is actually a, a perfusion heart-lung machine from cardiac surgery. But the basic idea is to have a device that could be a heart-lung bypass and maybe use it during CPR itself. And that's what eCPR is, with this notion of extracorporeal CPR by using a bypass machine or bypass circuit. And, and this has been used in a variety of settings and, and continues to be explored. One way it's being explored is, um, is, is as a bridge to uh, the cath lab. And you can either use um, mechanical CPR, like a Lucas device, or eCPR is a bridge to, to the cath lab. For example, if you think someone's having refractory VFib from an MI, and, and studies have looked at that. But Anyway, eCPR, I think, is going to be whoops, an important modality again for, for the next few years because a number of studies have now suggested that in the right hands with the right training, it can be a, a rescue technique for refractory arrest. Now, I just want to close a little bit with uh, COVID-19, uh, which is, of course, affecting all of us and continues to affect us. And, and what is its impact on resuscitation care? Well, as we all know, it has not impacted resuscitation care in the positive. For bystanders and providers, uh, healthcare providers alike, we have fears of contracting the virus during CPR. And there's also been some suggestions early during the pandemic that if you had a cardiac arrest with COVID, that it was just not going to work out, that game over. Um, so there was a little nihilism around cardiac arrest care for the COVID patient. Uh, the data on outcomes was less clear. And a number of earlier studies looked at this. Um, this was a, a study in the United States looking at uh, EMS and just the prevalence of COVID among EMS patients. And they actually found that very few patients actually had COVID um, in the early days during cardiac arrest. But nonetheless, um, EMS has grown very fearful and correctly so of uh, intubation and, and being in a closed space in the back of the ambulance. So to address this, the AHA put out this following sort of summary, um, talking about the importance of CPR and an out-of-hospital arrest that it can be done safely with masks. And, and it goes through some techniques and approaches that could be thought of to make CPR in the COVID patient or suspected COVID patient uh, more safe. There was also an interim guidance statement put out by the AHA, and this is looking at basic and advanced life flow support in both adult and pediatric arrest with COVID. So this is a useful resource document if you're thinking about how to design a safe uh, COVID-19 resuscitation protocol. I would advise you to, to check this out. There's detailed protocols and other information in there. Now, Work from our team um, very recently has suggested that cardiac arrest with COVID is not as bad as the first reports would su have suggested. Now, this should make a lot of sense to you. Early in the pandemic, all hell was breaking loose. And, and so the data were largely self-reinforcing because people felt there was a no hope and no way to get people back. So, and it was a resource issue as well. We looked at a, reg at a number of hospitals in the United States uh, over more recent times and found that survival, ROSC was 22%, and um, overall CPC-1-2 survival was around 11%, which is not so different from non-COVID in hospital cardiac arrest survival, suggesting, at least in a general sense, that COVID, sur COVID arrest can be survived that it is not hopeless. So no one should say, oh, they had an arrest while having COVID. We should, there's no hope for this patient and, and no care uh, need be given. This is other work that showed the same thing. Um, um, this is uh, out of Switzerland, and it showed um, a wide range in cardiac arrest survival over time, but a number of patients with COVID also uh, survived. So in summary, uh, uh, I've, I've covered a lot of ground in this lecture um, in, in a few different sort of discrete chapters, but, but I think the most important messages to leave you with are that high quality CPR matters. And I've shared with you some of the data supporting high quality CPR and how that plays out in the guidelines. And the way to do that is by measuring CPR through audiovisual feedback and other observations, and then using that information with the appropriate training and debriefing. So I really, really wish to encourage all EMS agencies to think about ways they can practically bring debriefing to their cardiac arrest, because I think debriefing can improve the culture of care. And I showed you the data when coupled with feedback, audiovisual feedback, it can make a real difference.
Then finally, yes, COVID-19 has impacted cardiac arrest, but survival is still possible. So I, I worry a lot that uh, that we're all going to grow um, numb to, to death from COVID, but, but if someone has a cardiac arrest event with COVID, uh, we really need to give them the best effort. And, and as I said, there are uh, resources on how to do this effectively and safely. So I think with that, I uh, also want to have a little shameless plug for some work we do here at Penn. Um, we have an educational program, by the way, no ads, I make no money from this, um, but something called the TTM Academy because it largely focuses on post-arrest care, but we also have a lot of content on CPR and resuscitation systems of care. We have a podcast program um, that's on iTunes and we have other resources that may be helpful for EMS and hospital-based providers. So feel free to check out some of our content at TTM Academy. And with that, I just want to highlight a number of uh, members of my team who've contributed to some of the work that I showed you and some of the work we're doing currently. And, and this is a photo, recent photograph uh, before COVID of a number of members of my team um, during a CPR training event in, in sort of happier days when we could meet in public and easily train people in CPR. I look forward to returning to those days, hopefully soon. And with that, I will uh, conclude. Thanks for your attention. And, and we'll have uh, hopefully some Q&A to follow this lecture. Thank you very much. Benjamin, how are you? I am fine. I'm fine. Thanks. It's, it's such a 21st century thing, like watching myself lecture and I'm here and you're yeah. there. Oh, I wish you returned to simpler yeah, times, you know? Me too. But, um, you know, we, we've adapted very well to this new technology. Um, firstly, thank you so yeah, much for great. that. A very condensed and informative masterclass in high performance CPR. We really appreciate that. And it really brings home a lot of the many uh, initiatives that we're really interested in at the moment and uh, many of our services across Australia and New Zealand are currently applying. I'll start off, um, I think there's a couple of great questions in the chat line. Um, I know you've answered some of them as, you, as you've gone, Benjamin, but there's a couple I'd like to explore a little bit further. In Australia, particularly and, and to a degree in New Zealand at the moment, we are seeing quite a significant rollout of mechanical CPR devices. I guess they've become more readily accessible. Training is there to support them. What's your thoughts about mechanical CPR kind of in day-to-day -day use in um, resuscitation activities in the field? A little bit of the background on this. So, so it's it's growing in the United States as well. And, um, uh, you know, opinions are varied about mechanical CPR. So there's no right answer be sure. So I, I'm neither a, a big fan nor a big detractor. And I think mechanical CPR definitely has important roles in the field when there's a number of considerations, including long transport times. Um, one of the things I commented in the chat, but just to say it explicitly, um, I, I, I tend to try to get out of the ivory tower and live in the real world. I'm a practicing emergency doc. Mm. spent a lot of time listening to EMS people. I got to say, some EMS people are my best teachers because they, they tell me the way it really is. And, and I've really become absolutely convinced that um, performing high quality CPR in the back of an ambulance for more than say 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes is just next to impossible. It's a, it's a myth. Yeah. And, and so I would imagine in many situations in rural Australia, maybe, uh, forgive my Australian uh, lack of knowledge, but I would imagine there's rural areas that get transported to Sydney or Melbourne or Perth from the interior of the country. There may be very long helicopter transports or other transport times. Um, so, you know, you need to do something. Yeah. Um, I, I think mechanical CPR has the same cautionary tales, I think, as feedback devices, meaning the technology is not the magic bullet. It's not going to solve our problem. It's technology in the setting of appropriate training and QA. We have mechanical CPR in an emergency department. And I got to say, I was actually just in a cardiac arrest last week where the device kept slipping over the abdomen. And I, I knowing the device as well as I do, I was very involved, very much managing the device. If I hadn't been there, no one would have noticed because I said, hey, guys, it's slipping. And they're like, what, what? And we'd have to slide it back over the thorax because the machine wouldn't tell, you know, can't tell you. And and compressing the abdomen does you no good. Uh, uh, and I, so I fear these devices without lots of QA and, and good training up front can, can be misleading. Or rather, people think, oh, 
I'm amazed our survival isn't improving. We instituted these great mechanical devices. Well, you need the training, you need the key. Yeah, absolutely, and we're seeing that too. And certainly having some form of regular checklist where someone is continually responsible for the, uh, ensuring the position is correct is really fundamental. And it's much more safe. I mean, yeah, I also come to really appreciate the safety mm. considerations. You know, don't keep you on the back of an ambulance where you're not well secured and you're going over rural roads, going way too fast. It, it's a real danger for providers. Yeah, so. awesome. Double sequential defibrillation has always been a hot, to hot topic. I love hearing some of the debates about it over the years. What's changing in this space, Benjamin? Um, and why are we getting to, I guess, a position where it just seems far more reasonable and acceptable to consider it? I think it's 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 a it's an intervention that is being actively explored. In many ways, it's coming of age. I, I think if one were to do it currently, it is not counter to any guidelines. So, so if people wish to try it, it's not wrong to try it. I would say this, I, I would not try it as your initial intervention in VFib because certainly plenty of ventricular fibrillation is shockable through conventional means. So DSD is very much a rescue approach. You know, after all, you need two defibrillators, you need multiple people. So it, it, you don't want to slow down the attempt to defibrillate just to wait for two defibrillators. So by definition, this is now going to be the third, fourth, fifth shock, somewhere down the line. So I'm a big believer, once you've gotten that far down to resuscitation, you know, hey, try anything. You know, we're, we're now getting into difficult mm. terrain. But but certainly the first few shocks should be standard. Now, there is a major trial underway right now, um, led by Sheldon Cheskis in Toronto. I think those results should be forthcoming in the next 6 to 12 to uh, you never know a study, 18 to 24 months, reasonably soon in, in the time scale of all of our careers. So, uh, as, and, and it will be definitive randomized trial data, multi-site trial data from Canada. So I think that will hopefully, uh, you know, put this to bed for us and either it works or it doesn't work. Now, remember, this is only a small slice of our cardiac arrest. I don't know it is in Australia, but in the U.S., the majority of arrests these days are not shockable mm. for a variety of reasons. One of which is because AEDs are present, and so they're sort of quickly solving some of the VFib problems. So the EMS responses are probably majority PEA, where DSD won't have a role. Um, and then of the VFibs, many of them are shock responsive to standard shocks. So, so we're really so lest one worry that you're misunderstanding DSD or oh my god, I got to learn this new thing. Know that it only works for a subset of a subset of arrests. So this is it's an important area, but sort of a boutique area. Um, you know, maybe affecting five to ten percent of all cardiac arrests. Um, nonetheless, I, I, I think we should all pay attention for the study coming out of Canada. They've been very tight-lipped for usual reasons because it's a randomized trial. They don't want to, you know, leak stuff out. But 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 it is underway, and I think will help us understand. It. So so within a year we sh or two, we should have a good. Right. answer. I've got a question from Anthony that's, as he says, loosely related to DSD. Um, should adrenaline still be used in refractory VF? Right, adrenaline. Adrenaline is a fascinating uh, topic because, you know, we believed in it forever. And and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I will tell you that the data on adrenaline are actually not great. Um, uh, so if one were to be a purist, one could say there's no good randomized control. Uh, trial data showing epinephrine or adrenaline works in cardiac arrest. Now, there's plenty of theoretical reasons, there's plenty of animal studies, so so I, I don't suspect we go rogue and not give it. What is becoming increasingly clear is that epinephrine is much less useful when given late and much more useful when given early. And there are a number of studies, and by the way, this is, I think, a growing theme in resuscitation science more generally. By the way, those of you following all the current controversies around post-arrest TTM, same thing. Timing is everything. In many therapies, it may be less important. In resuscitation care, when timing is, is so sensitive to timing, timing of epinephrine, timing of shocks, timing of cooling. So any given study that shows something works or doesn't work, you have to ask, well, did they time it right? You know, did they give it early enough? And, and it's becoming increasingly clear that when epinephrine is given very early, it's effective. When it's given late, it just, just doesn't matter so much. Probably just because, you know, you're just too far down the road of, of your attempted resuscitation. So, to your question, refractory mm. VFib. I think it should be given. I, I sort of believe in the th every three to five minutes guidelines, one milligram of epinephrine or adrenaline. But but I'll be the first to admit, I I believe in it, but there's not great evidence to support that. So I would say do it because we don't have much else at this point, but um, but the evidence is something. Excellent. And kind of following on from that one, I've got a question from Dan. And he's really asking about, um, what about infusions of adrenaline to reduce the stone heart effect on peaks and troughs? 
Mm, right. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll explain to those who are listening what was meant by Stoneheart. It turns out this has been shown um, in, in animals convincingly, and there's some data in humans that when you look, say, via in animals, you can do this with the MRI or CT in humans, echo. When you're deep into the resuscitation, 15, 20, 25 minutes, the heart goes through this thing, ischemic contracture is the technical name, but a stone heart is a good description. It becomes this hard, contracted nugget. Really, you can think of it as rigor mortis of the heart, sort of. I mean, it, it functionally. So, so compressions do no good. There's like no ventricular cavity. There's no squeeze left. So you can compress all you like. And this is one of the uh, uh, physiologic reasons why we think we do so poorly 20 to 30 minutes out from resuscitation. So you all know when you're called to a scene and there's been 20 minutes of arrest with no bystander CPR, you go in with very low hopes. You know, you give it a try, but you know, and probably that heart is contracted and there's nothing we can do. So how to reverse stone heart? remains a, a big open question. My hunch is it's not going to be the epinephrine. It's going to be the other thing to relax muscle, smooth muscle, and and and, and voluntary involuntary muscle. And I'm not I'm not a hardcore muscle physiologist, so I'm not I, I wouldn't want to make it up. But, but my hunch is it's not going to be epinephrine. That said, it, it, you know, a good point is made. These peaks in trophic epinephrine are probably not great because that's not very physiologic. No one's really tried during resuscitation, at least not clinically, the notion of sort of steady infusions of epi. Um, um, harder study to do. You need these sort of things set up and so forth. So we just don't know. But we do know that stone heart is a nightmare and we don't have good solutions currently. Right. I've got a question that follows on from our DSD discussion. What's your opinion on higher energy, so uh, greater than 200 joules versus DSD? Mm, right. So, you know, there's been this raging debate for quite some time. I think, dare I say it, largely driven by manufacturer incentives um, about the energy. You know, some manufacturers make ones that go to 360, some to 200. And so, you know, there's a natural debate about which is better and part driven by sales because if 360 is better, the 200 guy loses mm -hmm. out, if 360 is worse. You know, so there's some financial reasons why these debates are, are, are the fans, mm -hmm. the flames yeah. are fanned. Um, we don't know for sure. Um, the, the current data seems to suggest 200 is plenty, but, th but then how do you explain DSD? And, and the question was raised in the chat, it may not be just increasing energy. It may be the vector change issue. So if you're hitting it from two sides, so it may be less about the energy and more about the distribution and the angles of the energy. We don't really know, to be honest with you. Um, if you ask many electrophysiologists, they, they swear that 360 is better than 200. And there is some data uh, in the EP lab for some of the work that they do that it may be better. But that's a very different environment than out of hospital cardiac arrest. Out of hospital cardiac arrest, I haven't seen convincing data that you need 360. 200 seems to be plenty for most primary non-DSD mm. shocks. In um, Australia and New Zealand, we're certainly um, encouraging full recoil of the chest um, during our high performance CPR to the extent, you know, um, hand, the hand literally leaves the chest or the heel leaves, of the hand leaves the chest. What are your thoughts uh, on recoil? Yeah, yeah, excellent that you do that. I, I wish more um, in the US folks done this. You can think it's, it's a little, um, it falls off the radar screen because we all think about rate and depth, recoil sort of, less intuitive maybe i guess but it absolutely makes sense there's very good data on recoil we've published some data on leaning in humans showing that matters others have shown this in animals so so leaning you know when you're not coming off the chest completely with each compression you're basically not getting the full benefit of that in negative intrathoracic pressure of chest expansion so it really matters. So yeah, so whenever I teach CPR, I say, yeah, your hands should literally come off the chest, you know, a centimeter, just just, just pull it off. Because especially in long transports, mm -hmm. when people are fatigued and they don't realize it, they tend to start leaning more and more. Mm -hmm. and, and in the animal lab, you can definitely see decreased blood return to the heart, decreased efficacy of CPR. So I, I applaud you guys for focusing. Thank on you. Um, we've got lots of evidence to demonstrate, actually, even our, you know, fittest paramedics they're really only doing high quality CPR for two minutes at a time. They need a break to reset and someone else needs to take over because you do start slipping into those um, less effective uh, modes of compression. I've got a question here from Joseph. He's uh, asking if there's an indication to consider changing pads fairly often, particularly when you're doing multiple shocks. 
um, and they start mm. losing efficiency or effectiveness. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. You know, doing this long time, first time I've ever gotten that question. So that that's good. Uh, I've not found about that much. I've certainly not seen any data on that. You know, and and this speaks to almost more of an electrical engineering question. You know, does the conductivity of the gel change? Do the does the lead sort of wear out a little bit? I'm sure the manufacturers would say no because they'd say they've tested these. You know, I'm sure their pads go through like a 50 shock, 100 shock sequence to look for changes in voltage. But those are those are sort of like engineering laboratory conditions, not clinical conditions. So, so if you ask the industry, I'm sure they'd say no. But I honestly couldn't tell you one way or the other. I do suspect for the typical numbers of shocks you might give an arrest, three shocks, five shocks, 10 shocks, it probably doesn't matter. Now, as we all know, sometimes we have these refractory cases where we're giving 15, 20, 30 shocks. I, I don't know, I honestly don't know. It's, it's an interesting Yeah, question. got another interesting one from Greg actually here. He's asking about stack shocking and um, the ability or inability actually to do stack shocking with public access AEDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. AEDs are simple devices, and they're they're designed really as a, you know, under the premise of, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Better to have the bystanders do something. Um, after all, they have ma mandatory hands-off time when they do an analysis, and that's not so great because, you know, they might take 8 to 10 seconds to analyze the rhythm. There are other human engineering flaws with, I think, a lot of AEDs on the market today. So AEDs are far from perfect. Uh, but I think the general assumption is that, well, if you get an AED on very rapidly in a witnessed arrest and it's VFib and they deliver a shock, the chance of shock success is actually quite high. And, and, and there's good evidence to support that assumption that, that in, in when AEDs are used early and appropriately in VFib, you get 75, 80% shock efficacy, which is just terrific. You know, so you, you can, by the time EMS gets there, many people are awake and, and, and doing okay. Um, now, could you imagine AEDs with advanced yeah. modes to do other sorts of resuscitation, sort of intermediate, maybe, but you know, it, it gets complicated complicated because who's buying them, who's using them, who's training for them and so forth. So there's a, what you're seeing here is a real tension between simplicity because it's for the public, like a fire extinguisher, yeah. and, and all the tricks of Absolutely. our trade. Uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately, Benjamin. I'm going to ask one last question. There's a few questions unanswered in our chat, and we might just work out how we might get some answers for those from you at a later date. But my last question really is from this from Brendan. What are your thoughts on intra-arrest uh, thrombolytics for patients with evidence of a STEMI prior to arrest or present with a suspected PE? Uh, one of my favorite questions. Thank you, Brandon. My favorite, it's good to end on that one. Um, so uh, a little bit of context and background. There was a major study looking at this, a randomized controlled trial um, uh, called the Troika trial. I think 2007, 2008, Burton Bottinger and others, and it was published in the England Journal, where they randomized patients in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to receive TPA, although it may have been streptokinase at the time, thrombolytics mm -hmm. that the, versus not. And they found no benefit of thrombolytics. Now, they did it for all out-of-hospital arrests because it was a pre-hospital study. They didn't want to get complicated and fancy with trying to diagnose STEM or PE. But, you know, you could imagine that would be negative. In hindsight, it's easy to critique these things because most cardiac arrests are not STEMI or PE. Most cardiac arrests are electrical or other things. So, so the point being, there are many cases where it's probably useless to begin with. So could you imagine a study that randomizes patients to thrombolytics where you have some very specific criteria to say, we have a high pretest probability of PE. You know, maybe the family has to say they were short of breath all day, or maybe they have to have a history of yeah. PE. Uh, you know, you could make various criteria. That study has not mm. been done. And I'm dying for that study to be done. I've thought about it myself a number of times, but life's too short and I'm just doing too many other things. So it's, it, for me, it's just sort of like one of these dream yeah. studies. If someone wants to pick that up in Australia, I'd be, I'd be, I'd love to see it. We don't know, but I haven't answered your question, by the way. So I think there's probably a role through thrombolytics. I do. The problem is in current practice, we tend to do it late. We tend to do it as, as it, I don't know if you have the saying in, in Australia, a Hail Mary pass, it's an American yeah. football term. Like the end of the game, you have no idea, you just throw it up and hope for the best. There must be some rugby version of that, yeah. that terminology, I don't know. Hospital right. pass. Uh, so, a hospital sorry? pass. A hospital yeah. pass, there you go, that sounds good. So, so we do it so late, though, so of course it's not gonna work. So I think TPA has gotten a bad name. Um, I think if it's gonna work, it's gotta be given early. So 
if someone were to say, look, we have a really, really likely PE or, oh, here's a good example. Someone comes into the hospital or, or is picked up, they have a known PE. Maybe, maybe you go to a patient um, in their home and they're horribly short of breath <clears throat> and their loved one said they were diagnosed with the PE and sent home on, their own, on uh, something, uh, no matter, some agent. And in front of you, they arrest and you know they've got a PE. I would give them TPA right out, right at this. I mean, just with TPA, I, I would. Now, that's not in any guidelines, but it's not against any guidelines either, by the way. Um, it's just a brave move. Excellent. Nice point to finish on. And uh, look, if you're ever doing a, uh, a, a multi uh, um, city multi trial around the world, um, I'm sure there's some uh, of us in Australia would be keen to, keen to jump on board. It'd be awesome. Love it. Love it. Excellent. Uh, we have to finish there. Um, it's been a great conversation. Uh, lots of amazing interest from our um, attendees. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've got people viewing from all over the world. So um, it's, it was a global webinar. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm very honored. And, and people should feel free to put my email address and some websites in the chat. Yeah. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, email, whatever. Happy to answer other questions or carry on the conversation. Okay. That's amazing and very generous. Thank you so much. It's um, a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. We'd love to have you back um, at some point in the not too distant future. And, um, maybe live one day. When yeah, absolutely. That would be amazing. Thank you again for your time. All right, guys. Have Thank a good you. day. Have a good Thank afternoon. You. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, thanks for your questions. They've been amazing. Um, just a reminder here that our next webinar is coming up, which is on the 28th of September. So you can register now. Get in early, um, just in case we have to limit the numbers to 500 again. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and uh, we'll see you all again in a month. Thank you now. Thank you for attending update of AHA and ERC CPR guidelines, proudly supported by Philips and presented by Dr. Benjamin Abella. Join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, the 28th of September, which will be the trapeze panel. In the meantime, be sure to follow us on social media to keep up to date. Twitter at the Council of AM1 and Facebook and LinkedIn, the Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.